Hey everybody, this is Athletes in Antiquities, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about hobby sweethearts and you know why high population isn't always a bad thing. So, you know, like I said, in this video is all about um, population and why, you know, a lot of people look at a high population card and they shy away from that card because, you know, oh, supply and demand, like that there's so many out there. It's that, that this card's going to tank in price. And, you know, there is a lot of um, logical nervousness around a card with very high population, but especially in the modern era when everyone's grading everything every card is high population and you know it's it's drawing a lot of concern from from collectors and what i just want to compare um some pokemon to sports cards to kind of show you that like you know say like a high population can be satiated by a high demand and it, it can be a, a very stable card for decades you know so obviously a, a higher supply of an item means that it's harder for that item to maintain its price you know basic economics tells us this you know if supply is increasing, uh, flat demand would cause a decrease in price. You know, this is this is an objectively true formula, but there's something crucial about graded cards that make this equation a bit harder to apply to card prices. You know, with most things, the producer sets the quantity and the consumers simply react to that supply with their, with, with their demand to influence the price, you know, like, so, each, each party controls one of those two things. The, the producer of the item, they, they control the overall quantity and then the consumers decide, you know, how much of those they want and they set the demand and, and it's, it's, it's a harmony. And, you know, this is obvious, everyone knows this, but there's one variable with graded cards. And in a way, the, the reason the, the variable is like, in a way, consumers dictate both the supply and the demand. And, you know, I'm going to pause for a second and explain what I mean by that. Because, like, obviously, the Pokemon company is is setting how many of each card are produced from the factory. You know, they say, oh, we want a thousand of this, 500 of that, whatever. But, you know, the consumers uh, decide how many of those cards get sent off to grading. So, for the, for the people that want a graded card, they rely on consumers taking that supply that's taken from the company and set to this third party and which basically makes like a, a new population essentially you know if tpci makes a hundred thousand charizards you know let's look at this base set charizard here they make a hundred thousand charizards um and they make let's say this haunch grow and this charizard they're from the same set obviously it's not true but just for the sake of this example all right so they're gonna make uh these are gonna be in the same set this is gonna be the the, the 2024 uh, base set brilliant stars set, you know, so they're making a hundred thousand Charizards and they're making a hundred thousand haunch crow cards uh, So the community takes that and let's and the community is aware of it. They know there's a, they know there's a hundred thousand of each one but um, The consumers take those cards that are set by the company and they decide you know what we're gonna grade a thousand of these Charizards and you know We're only gonna grade a hundred of these haunch crows you know, if you just look at the numbers on the paper and don't have any context behind those numbers, the Charizard, well, it's flooding the market, you know? Oh, Charizard's gonna crash. There's there's 10 times as many being graded. Um, it, it, there's no way that can, be, that can be satiated. But in actuality, that could likely lead to a, a much stronger price than the Snorlax because there is so much more demand uh, to fulfill that 10 times higher graded quantity. You know, people that just look at the numbers on the paper, that they, they go on psacard.com slash cert, you know, I've got that unlocked because I, I go, I spend way too much time on that, on that website. They'll look at those numbers and take them as gospel, not realizing the consumers are the ones deciding how many of those cards get sent out. They say, oh, well, well there's more of this card than the other one uh, out there. So therefore this other one's rare or, oh, um, you know, uh, like they'll draw conclusions as if that population on the PSA website or the CGC website, whatever it may be, or the broken BGS website, they'll look at the population there and treat it as if the Pokemon company itself is setting those prices or sorry, sorry, is setting those populations. 
like, oh, you know, there was there was five times as many of this card graded as this card. So therefore, this card must be rare. And they're not thinking like, no, they're, that's just the, the, the amount that the consu consumers have decided to grade. It's a very weird fallacy that a lot of people fall into. And I, I've done this in the past as well. And I've had to like, you know, train that out of me because it, it's so easy to look at numbers on a piece of paper and then draw a conclusion from it immediately. A lot of the hobby does this and I feel like it causes cards to rise in value like people that it'll cause people to buy a card they might not have or not buy a card they might have wanted to because they've drawn some bizarre conclusion by just looking at the PSA population you know um and so this whole thing about you know oh like we set the own the, the, the PSA pop the CGC pop it might seem fairly obvious to anyone that's dealt with graded cards in a, in a mass quantity but the point of this is to illustrate how using population as an argument for or against a card can be completely irrelevant to the price or stability of that item if you don't have any context behind it. If you're only looking at, oh, there's a hundred thousand, or sorry, there's a thousand Charizards and a hundred Honchkrows, you can form no logical, no logical data with that. That's, that's not, without anything behind those numbers, those numbers are meaningless. But people attach a lot of value to it. And like I said, I've done the same thing in the past, um, but it's just, it, it, it's very it's very odd to me how how people treat PSA populations as gospel um, and you know like I've been saying this um, I, I, I've certainly mentioned this in the past or I've certainly done what I'm teaching you against in the past but I think it's important to you know talk against your previous self as you mature because I've, I've, I've done this in the past in past videos I've been like oh look at how low this population is and I haven't provided any context behind that and you know looking looking at those now I realize how how misleading that can be if you try to um if you try and draw a conclusion from it's like trying to to find the the angle or, or um the slope of a, of a graph by one point by one data point like no you, you need two you need two points you need more context to find the slope and i i i would draw a similar conclusion to this and the pope the point of this video is not to say that graded population is irrelevant in any situation if you provide context to the numbers it's an invaluable metric. Like I said, I spend a lot of time on PSA website, whether it's just, oh, I like this card. I wanna see what it's like. I wanna compare it to other cards or whether it's for a financial reason other than other than just collecting. I spend a lot of time on the website because there is invaluable metrics on with that data, but many people don't ask why. And they don't ask why when presented with data. Like I said, they'll take that one point and draw their own slope from it, which, using this math analogy is completely like that there's there's absolutely no logic there <clears throat> you know uh comparing populations to something like trophy cards however i would say like w when you get to more rare items it can it can become more valid because as a card it a card that is much rarer a higher percentage of the population in general has usually been graded um you know like when w with these high-end trophy cards when one of those cards is discovered, it's graded almost immediately. Unless your name is Dave Person, you probably either only buy graded trophies, or I mean, <laughs> I'm saying this is if ever, as if all of the viewers buy trophies. I don't, I don't own a single trophy, but like those people that do, uh, they either only buy a graded one because there's so many fakes out there, or they buy a raw and immediately grade. There's very few people that collect them raw. Like I said, Dave Person is one of the only ones that I can think of. Um, but something like that, where a large percentage of the population is on display on these, on these, uh, graded charts and stuff, you can compare them more logically. Like, oh, you can look at the amount of illustrators in the PSA pop. What is it like 39 or I just made that up. I have no idea. I'll put it on screen. Whatever the PSA pop of illustrators are, you know, there's probably not like 10 times as, as that many out in the wild. So with a very large sample size, I like percentage wise, you can, there is much more logic behind drawing a conclusion from there. Like, oh, let's say three quarters of the illustrators are graded. That, I, again, I just made that up. Like there's, there's, you can have more context there because you know, that, you know, there's less variables, if that makes any sense. I, I'm rambling, I apologize. But the opposite end of the spectrum is the point of this video. I know it's 10 minutes in, I'm finally getting to the point of the video, I apologize, but the opposite end of the spectrum is what I like to call hobby sweethearts. And I don't know if someone else has used this term, 
uh, but I came up with it, you know, on my own, so I'm, I'm coining it. <laughs> coined and minted. Been there, coined that. Uh, but my definition of hobby sweethearts are cards that are hobby favorites with astronomical populations, but demand is so high that it basically doesn't matter. I know I don't collect too many of these, but I do have the four that I'm showing you are definitely fall in that category, in my opinion. You know, base set Charizard, there's tens of thousands of them. This Barry Bonds pseudo rookie card, I think 86 was technically his rookie, but like no one really likes that card. So like this card, there's tens of thousands of them. You know, Michael Jordan junk wax era cards. I, I love them because the art is cool. Like this Michael Jordan, it's one of the best photographs of Michael Jordan on a card. And this card is like $15. Um, and you know, same thing with, with um, um, full arts, well, I'm blanking on them, alternate arts, but you know, we'll get into those later. So these are all what I would consider um, hobby sweethearts. You know, cards that everyone loves, and everyone keeps buying. And that's the crucial part. Everyone loves them and everyone keeps on buying them. You know, in sports, like I, I mentioned the Barry Bonds, but probably the best example of a hobby sweetheart in sports, if you do follow sports, you're already aware of this, is the Ken Griffey Jr. Upper Deck rookie uh, Star Rookie card. Um, that was a mouthful, but I'll put it on screen. As At the time of this video, it has a PSA population of 103,000. 103,000. You know, that that card, the population is, it's hard to even grasp. 103,000 of one card. But that, look on eBay. That card flies off of eBay in PSA 9 and PSA 10. It still commands a high price. Again, I'll put it on screen. It commands a high price in PSA 10, PSA 9, even PSA 8. You can get, like, there is a value there. And it's a stable value. And you might think, how is that possible? There's 103,000. Like those, the, the market must be flooded and not really. And that's kind of the point. That's kind of the whole point of this video is yes, there's, 100, there's 103,000, but like there is, there, there are buyers for every seller, it seems. And you know, that's sports, but you know, Pokemon is no exception. The numbers are smaller because the hobby for a while was much smaller. You know, now, now you can make that argument, but you know, my favorite example is Ancient Mew. I've mentioned it before, Ancient Mew is one of the biggest hobby favorites in Pokemon. The total population at the time of this video is over 34,000, but check eBay, PSA 8, PSA 9. These cards have stable prices and they fly off eBay every day. PSA 10 is a little bit harder um, because they're very hard to grade. So PSA 10, the number is a little bit more erratic but PSA 8, PSA 9, there is a pretty solid market value for those. I don't want to say it on screen because I don't, I don't want to say something wrong, but I will put it, I will put it on screen for what these stable, you know, average prices you can expect. And with how large the population is, the prices are fairly, um, you know, they're fairly flat, which despite what a lot of people think, that's a good thing. S flat prices are a good thing. Everyone's used to rocket ship to the moon, but in, in this space at this magnitude of population, that's a good thing. You know, other examples, Illustration Contest Charizard, um, common Black Star promos from the early Black Star days, you know, flying and surfing Pikachus, WB stamp promos, you know, all the way down the line, these, these, these cards with tens of thousands of copies, but you know, uh, uh, they, they still have insane demand. So those cards are stable. And the reason I wanted to bring up, um, the full art cards from Sword and Shield, all the art, alternate arts. I think alternate arts, if demand stays for them, is they, they can join that um, echelon as well with how high the populations are, but with how popular they are. In a few years, that's definitely a possibility. But one thing to note is that when I say a high population may be a good thing, something key has to be true. And if you stayed this, if you stayed this far, this is kind of where the key point is. The population has to come from steady collector demand. Now you might ask like, how could you possibly know that from looking at a pop report? Well, you know, you can't usually, that's kind of the point of this video. But in my opinion, if you do want to get a grasp of that, the best way to do it is watch how the population grows over time. The how the population grows can give you a lot of insight into the minds of the people that were grading that item, you know, uh, and these things usually don't become clear for multiple years. It usually takes multiple years for you to really see this trend. But the trend tends to be if a car is released 
in the first few months, the population explodes, then trails off. There's a massive spike, and then it's almost like a logarithmic uh, graph. Um, it, uh, like that's most likely due to speculators grading them in droves and dumping them. If a card has, you know, consistent population growth over time, on the other hand, while, you know, card prices remain consistent, that's generally a good indicator of natural demand. If, if it's a steady slope upward, prices aren't shooting up and shooting down, there it's a, either a steady increase or, you know, a flat, a flat price as this demand is slowly growing, that's a great indicator of natural demand. You know, with something like Ancient Mew, the tens of thousands of population, they're not stopping people from submitting them. People still submit them almost at a higher rate than they did before. And the price is still holding, thus, you know, satiating, you take a shot every time I say satiating, the increased supply. Um, and so going back to our, 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 our boy alternate art here, I only have one alternate art because I thought this card was cool and it was like 10 bucks um, raw. And then I, I whiffed on the grade, I thought I was gonna get a 10. Anyway, so this was definitely not a, not a profitable grade, but I mentioned sword and shield alternate arts, you know, uh, stop the clock. How long did it take me to mention alternate arts? It seems like it's every video. Um, I, I just love talking about them, but I think they have the potential, like I said earlier, to fall into this category in a few years. It's far too early to tell, you know, how the hobby will view these items. Um, you know, when, when Sword and Shield becomes another mid-era set, that, that's a possibility. I mean, it's, a, it's an inevitability. In five years, Sword and Shield will be mid-era, kind of like how Black and White is seen as mid-era right now. You know, I was, I was here when Black and White was new, and I've watched it slowly, I mean, yeah, yeah over time, just kind of drift into the mid-era glob where people don't really talk about them. So alternate arts will be mid-era soon. And you know, if there's if they aren't swept under the rug, they can absolutely have a similar position to these other cards in the hobby. You know, when I label something as a hobby sweetheart, I by no means think it's some great investment that you can, you know, hold on and and, and turn for a profit, but I do think it shows that the card has incredible demand despite a high supply. So if the hobby continues succeeding, um, those cards probably will as well. And that's, that's kind of the big takeaway from, from a hobby sweetheart is as betting on the hobby, just maintaining itself or even, even in a small decline with, with the amount of attention those cards have, there's been numerous years, decades, even for some cards of high demand, despite high supply and nothing's corrected yet and corrected implies that there's a problem and nothing has corrected yet. So I really don't think there is a problem with those high prices or sorry, with those, I guess I would say stable prices with the high demand. And I kind of want to end it with this. Even if the PSA pop of, of 34,000 for ancient Mew, even with that 34,000 population, I do not see a, a situation where PSA nines fall to $15. You can clip this if it happens and uh, light me up, but even with 34,000 copies, I do not see a situation where Ancient Mew falls to $15 unless the entire hobby as a whole fails. And that's what a hobby sweetheart is. A, a hobby sweetheart, it, it can support itself. It's it's gone past the, the, the time period of, oh, you know, that's gonna crash. Population's way too high. Not enough people want that. No one's saying that about Ancient Mew because it's established itself. It's, it's, a, it's established itself as a hobby sweetheart. And I think things like alternate arts could find themselves there if people still like them. If no one cares about them in, in five years, then no. But with with the populations, you know, even with the populations, I should say, it's definitely possible. So this video was a lot of rambling. Um, I apologize for that. I, I tend to do that. I have like some bullet points off to the side and then I'll talk for each one for like five minutes more than I thought I would. But you know, do you think high population cards, you know, shouldn't be touched with a 10 foot pole? Do you get nervous when you see 5,000, 10,000, 15,000? Or do you see that as an indication of a card with very strong demand that can maintain itself for years to come? Let me know in the comments because you can definitely take it either way and you can have a logical argument for either direction. Um, I don't think anyone is stupid. Um, I I'm tending on the side that if it has established history, it could be seen as a good thing. But you know, if you disagree with that, uh, please let me know. I, I read all my comments. So yeah, um, let me know. Uh, thanks for watching. Bye.